Hi, and welcome to ADI's Deep Dive series, where we take a more in-depth look at some of the pedagogy associated with ADI. I'm Ashley Murphy, and today we're going to be looking at generating and testing hypotheses. Students often struggle to connect hypotheses to procedures during lab activities. And part of the reason for this is that students often equate scientific hypotheses with scientific predictions. So to understand how to help students use hypotheses, let's take a quick step back and look at what hypotheses and predictions are in the context of science. Science is a hypothetical deductive process, and it's done through the generation and testing of alternative explanations for phenomena. Those alternative explanations are known as hypotheses. A hypothesis is a proposed explanation to a question or an observation, some sort of puzzling event or phenomena, something that a student has said, okay, let's look at this, what's a potential answer to what's going on here? When we ask students to form hypotheses in ADI, we want them to identify the possible answers to, in our case, a guiding question. These possible answers are conditional upon the support of a test. So what we're really asking students is first let's identify the possible explanations or answers to this guiding question and then let's develop that test. Let's see if any of those answers are supported by evidence. Support from evidence can be identified if the expected outcome of a test based on hypothesis is similar enough to the actual outcome of that test. So if results of a test are far from expected values, then that hypothesis will need to be abandoned because it's not supported by evidence. The expected outcome of a test of a hypothesis is called a scientific prediction. Predictions are based on a test, so students should be developing predicted outcomes after developing their test. It's, as is true with any skill, the best way to get better is to practice. For students to strengthen hypothesis generation and testing skills, they need to be given the chance to actually develop and test hypotheses. And this means that we have to abandon prescribed labs in favor of allowing students to develop and test their own hypotheses. So in ADI, we work to support students' growth in hypothetico-deductive reasoning by giving them an avenue to practice it with support. And we use the investigation proposal as one form of support. So let's take a look at an example of hypothesis generation during our investigation proposal. Here we have one of our investigation proposals. This is a tool that's available free on our website and in all of our books. Um, and this is something that you can use to support your students as they generate and test hypotheses. So let's consider a problem, right? Let's consider a problem, um, how do salmon find their way back to their home stream? So salmon go back to the stream in which uh, they were spawned to spawn. Um, and the question is, how do they find their way back? So there's a couple of different w avenues that we can use to kind of explore this, a couple of different answers, um, at least to start with, right? One would be that they navigate by sight. Another is that they navigate by smell. So we've got our two explanations, two potential explanations, right? And we can use some of our background knowledge of senses to develop some of these possible alternative explanations. Um, but then what we need to do, since we've come up with our hypotheses, is to develop a test. So in this case, we can tag salmon so we can identify them. We can blindfold some salmon, so take away their ability to navigate by sight. We can plug the noses of some other salmon, so take away their ability to navigate by smell. And then we're going to leave some alone as a control. And we're going to look at the number of salmon that actually return to their home stream. So the data we're going to collect is the number of salmon from each group that return to their home stream. And then we'll take some time to graph these numbers compared to each other so that we can see which group had the different numbers returned, which group had the fewest return. So now we need to think about, well, OK, what will my data look like if either of these hypotheses are supported? So if our first hypothesis that salmon navigate by sight is supported, we should expect to see data that looks like this, right? The blind salmon are going to have a really hard time finding their way back to their stream, home stream to spawn. But if the navigate by scent hypothesis is supported, then our prediction, our predicted result is going to look different. The salmon with plug noses are going to have a lot harder time getting back to their home stream because they're not going to have the ability to navigate using the sense that helps them find their way back. So then we ask students to go ahead and perform that test, to get some data. So let's suppose that our data looks like this, um, that we saw we released 1,000 salmon in each group, and we saw you know near 800 salmon from the blindfolded and control groups return. So we go ahead and take a graph of that data. Well, now we kind of have an idea about what our actual data looks like. And so what's left to go back and do is think through this process. So if salmon navigate by smell, and I do this procedure, right? I do all these things. 
then I can conclude that my data should look like this. So if I get my data, then I just compare my data to my expected outcome and I can form a conclusion. So in this case, therefore, the navigate by site explanation is not supported. The navigate by scent explanation is supported. And so based on this evidence, we can conclude that salmon navigate by scent. Some things to think about, students will often write decontextualized predictions um, when they're asked to write hypotheses, right? So that can be a struggle for students. So for example, let's look at this guiding question. This is actually from one of our labs. How is changing the number of coils of wire around a nail in an electromagnet affect the strength of that electromagnet? If we think through this, there's three potential answers to this question. You can word them different ways, but really there are three. As the number of coils of wire are increased, the strength of the magnet is increased. As the number of coils of wire are increased, the strength of the magnet is decreased. And that there's not really a relationship between those two things. And so we need to develop a test for those. But students will often write something like this. They get really caught up in specifics, and their first attempt at a hypothesis often looks something like this. If the electromagnet has 40 coils, it will pick up 6 grams. Maybe they're, they're testing the amount of mass that that electromagnet can pick up. So they get very caught up in thinking about how they're going to test things, and that's good. They've thought about a test, but they haven't really thought about the potential answers to a question. And what you'll notice is this hypothesis or really a, a decontextualized prediction, could not possibly be an answer to the guiding question, right? So it's a decontextualized, unscientific prediction. Scientific predictions are dependent on tests, which are created to test hypotheses. So we need a hypothesis. In order to make a prediction about what might happen, we have to develop a test. And in order to develop a test, we need to develop some potential explanations for the phenomena under investigation first. So there's some things to do. Remind students of what hypotheses and predictions are in science. Remind students to answer the guiding question. That's usually a big one. Uh, I can find that 40 to 50% of the issues that I have with students can be fixed by saying, hey, is that, is that answering the guiding question? Allow students to reason through generating and testing their own hypotheses. You can't get better at something if you don't try it over and over again. And when students struggle, it's evidence that they need to do things more, not less. Give students chances to practice generating hypotheses and developing tests outside of ADI labs. Maybe you walk into class that day and for about five minutes, we're working on generating potential answers to a question that you've put up on the board. It doesn't always have to be something that's done through ADI. The more chances we give our kids to practice generating hypotheses, the better they'll be at their next lab. And finally, use the investigation proposal as a, as a tool and make sure that the students understand the if and then their four labels that are on the investigation proposal and an integral part of hypothetical deductive reasoning, which we're trying to support. Some things to avoid, don't ask or encourage students to pick a hypothesis that they think will be right. It's not very beneficial to students. And don't tell them in advance what they should see. Because these two things could lead to data fabrications, kids trying to make their data look like what they think should fit, and it won't help them to develop hypothetical deductive reasoning skills, which is what we're trying to build. Thanks so much for watching this video. Keep a lookout for the next video in the ADI Deep Dive series. As always, don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter and like us on YouTube. If you liked this video, please go ahead and give us a thumbs up. Let us know how we're doing. We're always reachable on our social media platforms, but you can also shoot us an email at info at argumentdriveninquiry.com. Thanks.